So uh, we shall move on to our next speaker, um, who's Steve um, Batty from Meld Studio. Steve's actually driven three hours to be here today, so thank you very much for coming down, Steve. Uh, just to Good morning, everybody. Um, my name's Steve Beatty. I'm the principal of a design company that's uh, based in Sydney, right opposite St Andrew's Cathedral. It's a lovely spot. Um, if you've ever been there, if you've ever been there, um, they have some fabulous bells, Carillion, that they sort of play and practice with all the time. Um, I'm reminded of that as I sort of uh, did final preparations for this talk last night, and they were practicing. If you've ever heard someone practice those bells, it's an interesting when they get into a try something, fail, try something, fail again. The idea of sort of failing gracefully and, and learning from that experience takes on a whole new meaning when you've got big bells involved. I'll leave you with that. Um, we do uh, design-led innovation type work for organisations. Large, typically, um, we deal in a space that uh, generally deals in sort of the hundreds of thousands or millions of people on the receiving end of the services that we typically help um, government and large commercial organisations make better. Uh, that's a really simplistic way of describing it. I'll get into to some detail. I'll talk about some things. Um, in addition to running Melt Studios, uh, I organised some conferences around user experience and design, uh, both here and in New Zealand and occasionally overseas. Um, and I also get involved in judging of awards and various other things, and I sit on a thing called the Good Design Council of Australia. Uh, it keeps me occupied, um, and it gives me some insight into today's topic which I'm sure you're feeling sort of happier about that I'm going to talk about something relevant, hopefully. So um, that's a little bit about me and, and a very, very little bit. Um, what I want to talk about is this notion of innovation and this notion of changing things and making things better. I love the, the definitions that we sort of have left behind us when it comes to innovation. Uh, things like a revolution or an insurrection is my favourite one. The idea, though, that we are radically changing the things that we see around us today. These aren't small, timid steps. That, uh, that notion of being bold and taking very, very big steps to change things is something that I'll talk about. It's something that we hear a lot about when it comes to innovation, especially this sort of disruptive innovation. And I'm going to leave you with a small message at the end about making small changes. I'll come back to that point. This idea of innovation is that we are changing something radically. We can do it in one big step. We can do it in 100,000 little steps. I can give you examples of both. One is not necessarily better than the other. The way in which we work, our design-led innovation approach, applies to both. I came across this statistic the other day, um, and it didn't really surprise me to a great extent, but the, the Genome Project, which is sort of mapping human DNA and, and, and how, we, how we look and, and breathe and, and, and work, the very sort of structure of us as people, um, went on for over a decade and cost a, a, a few billion dollars. That sort of makes sense when you think about the scale of the effort involved. Um, within a few years or in the space of a few years, I'll be able to have my own genome mapped for a, a hundred bucks, um, just like sort of getting some photos printed or a blood test. It won't be much more complicated than that. And it opens up a whole world of possibilities. One of which, which was given to me the other day, is that scientists currently recognise, at least some scientists recognise, that the first person who'll live a thousand years has already been born. They're already out there. Someone, maybe one of you, is going to live to be a thousand. Now, you think about sort of how we deal with people when they hit sort of 80 and 90 and, and God help me, live to 100 uh, and beyond, and what quality of life looks like as you get to those sorts of years. And I hope that in living a thousand years, we crack that nut and solve that problem of what life's like when we get older. I would hope that we're not looking at 920 years more like retirement looks like today. Um, talking about solving problems, and that's an interesting one, but it sparks a, a, a question and a challenge which says, when's that going to happen? I'm 42 and I'm kind of interested. Um, the second thing is that 
what we think of as old age is going to radically change and it will change radically all the time within 50 years. So within the space of 50 years, our notion of old age will constantly start to change because the people that we sort of now look at as old, the 80, 90, 100 year old people, will just be hitting their stride as adolescents, effectively. So, um, we start to think about some really sort of interesting challenges in that kind of space, and it raises some real questions for us. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how design works um, and why it works well in dealing with the sort of question, which is, how do you design society for people who are going to live a thousand years? So let's just use that as our big question for the day. How are we going to design a society, a society for people who are going to live a thousand years? One of the things that design helps us do and that you must do if you want to make sort of big changes to things is challenge your assumptions. Thinking about the same problem in the same kind of way is, is going to get you the same result. Putting different people in the room who are going to think about the same thing in the same way is going to get them the same result too. You need to think about things differently. You need to forcibly think about things in different ways. And the sorts of things that we need to think about, we're not going to come up with sitting in an office, sitting in a lab, sitting in a conference room or a boardroom. What we really need to do is understand people. And we need to challenge what we believe about what's important to them and go out and ask them ourselves. I recently did a project, um, or in the, I guess I'm taking a, a, a day off from this particular project, which is working with um, a chain of cafes in West Australia. Um, we spent, uh, over the last three weeks, we've spent about 150 hours sitting in cafes, watching the way people interact with the space, where they come from, where they go to afterwards, what they have while they're there, who they're there with. Took a photo of this gentleman who sat here for the better part of three hours. And we speculated and we speculated about why he's there and he looks like he's working and he looks like he's doing this and maybe he's doing that. And Part of what we were there to do was not only just watch people, and we watched something like seven or 8,000 customer interactions over a period of three weeks. People going up, buying coffee, leaving, coming, sitting down, some of whom sat for quite some time. And we sort of, we formed these hypotheses about these people. We formed a hypothesis about this guy. He seemed to sort of fit the bill of someone who was um, either sort of taking a change of scene from a home office or an office where he works on his own. What was he doing here? And we asked him. Now, I'd like you to sort of form an opinion of yourself. And one of the things that we noticed over the course of three hours is that people would come up and say hi, typically women, sort of women in their 30s and 40s, um, and at this time of day there was a big sort of uh, surge in them. Uh, people drop their kids off at school, they go to a cafe for a while, they meet up with friends, they do various things. A string of them kept coming up and saying hello to this gentleman. A little bit interesting, why? We were sort of asking ourselves, why? I mean, he's an, not an unattractive fellow. Um, he's on his own, you know, like the maybe. We asked him. And this is one of the tricks about design um, and one of the tricks about the, these sorts of processes when you want to understand people. It's best if you ask them. So you can watch and you can learn the things that they won't tell you, but it's also good to just go and ask a simple question. During this process, we interviewed something like 150 to 200 people. I'm still counting. Um, we asked this gentleman. He's the minister of the local Uniting Church. He comes here to do his paperwork, but the reason he comes here to do his paperwork is because this is where his parishioners come, because they're the ones who drop their kids off at the local school and this is where they come to meet. So he goes to them. And that was an interesting lesson. He goes to them. He sits, he does his own thing, and he's available to them in a way that they will be comfortable with and in an environment in which they'll be comfortable. And they can approach him if they want to, and maybe it's just say hi, and maybe he can say to them, how's your son doing who's been in trouble recently, or how's your daughter who's been in hospital? He has access to them and he can ask them those questions. That kind of process though, you, you don't get that making phone calls either. You don't, make, you don't get that doing surveys, you don't get that taking polls. This is the sort of thing you need to go out and do and observe, and the richness that you see from doing this is really quite clear. And very, very valuable. 
In Australia and, and in many parts of the developed world, we have an issue with an ageing population, and it's not the fact that they're going to live to 1,000. Um, people as they hit their 60s um, go through a range of problems. I heard a, and, a, this particular gentleman, uh, when he was 50, he was playing touch football, very, very fit and healthy individual. Um, was running around playing touch football and sort of uh, felt off and felt off in a way that couldn't really get a decent breath, didn't really sort of, you know, like he was dropping the ball quite literally when he was playing. Um, his wife, fortunately, is a nurse, um, and when he came off at half time and, and said, you know, like, I'm really not, really not feeling all that well, um, sent him off to hospital, and, and two days later he had a quadruple bypass, which saved his life. Um, up to that point, if you had have asked him how he was physically, he was healthy. Um, over the intervening sort of 10 years uh, since that incident, he's now 60, he's had melanoma cut out twice, including a big, long sort of piece that had grown from his neck down into his shoulder. Um, still living, thankfully. Um, one of the issues, though, that we sort of uh, can face and tackle, again, I heard another interesting statistic, that um, something like over half of your lifetime medical costs will be incurred in the last 18 months of your life. You think of like going through childbirth, like actually being born, all your vaccinations, all the colds and flus and visits to the doctor and breaks and all of the rest of it. Most of it will be incurred in the last 18 months of your life and most of that will be incurred in the last three days. Over 50% of your lifetime will be in the last three days of your life. Because if you think about it, you end up in the ICU, you end up in intensive care, you've got um, ambulance costs and a range of other things. We're working with a group down in Victoria to try and address those sorts of issues and issues that they get into um, and how you might change the system, but also in terms of insurance. Knowing that that's going to be the problem, knowing that in the last few days of someone's life, that's going to be where the expense is. That's a very newborn baby. That, that uh, is a, a photo of a baby um, in the first two hours of their life. It's one of my daughters, by the way, um, which is why I use the photo. I could invest money on her behalf now and solve that medical issue, solve that cost of healthcare issue by me putting money in the bank now if I could do it in a way that was tax effective and the rest of it, that would actually resolve that cost issue. I could do a similar thing and set her up in terms of superannuation. By the time she's 60, any money I invest today on her behalf will have doubled six times over. If I put $5,000 in the bank, it's going to go from five to 10 to 20 to 40 to 80 to $160,000 by the time she's ready to retire. You think of the difference $160,000 makes in terms of someone's retirement costs, it's huge. And for me today, it's not that big a deal. We could do that for every child when they're born. You think about the use of the baby bonus going to the parents, it could go to the kids. But that requires us to think a little differently about the problems that we're solving. It also requires us for a while at least to just set aside our firm, well-held beliefs about the way things must be. I was driving here in the car, I was trying to think of an example of what I mean by this, and I have an example for you. Imagine if on budget night, Wayne Swan, Joe Hockey, stand up and give a joint presentation on a budget that they developed jointly. Imagine that. Imagine if the budget process was a collaborative one rather than this contentious one that we currently have. The whole sort of setup of it. And I say that and I, I see a sort of a few people sort of... And I get that. And typically when we go through these sorts of processes, if that's not the reaction that you're getting, if you're not getting people laughing, if you're not getting people shaking your heads, then you're probably not really pushing yourself. It's only when the rest of the people in the room start to say, well, that's nuts, that you really find yourself getting into solid ground. One of the challenges, though, is that those sorts of ideas get shut down very quickly. I was in a session with a client not that long ago, about 12, 18 months ago, trying to crack one of the issues with superannuation. 
Um, they're a superannuation provider. They had they recognised the issue just as most of their competitors do. It was seen as something that if they could solve, then it would be of enormous benefit not only to the, to the industry but also to them as an organisation. It would set them apart and ahead. Senior person in the room, sort of after giving that kind of introduction, we need ideas, we need different thinking, we need people, you know, like you people in the room to really sort of think radically about this. And being a design consultant, sort of used to throwing ideas out there, I threw out the first idea. Okay, we need good ideas, says the senior person in the room. okay, this isn't going to be a, a brainstorming session that's going to go very far. And I was right. For the next three hours, we essentially had awkward silence because none of the other people in the room who get paid by this guy for a living were going to put their hand up so that they could be shot down as well. Now, the whole point is that you need this environment. You need this kind of space. You need to give yourself the opportunity to just give it a couple of minutes and think it through. It may be a, a dumb idea, maybe it is, but it may have the seed of something that's a whole lot more powerful if you give it two minutes before you throw it in the bin. One of the things about design and just the way in which we go through this process is we explore ideas cheaply. What you're looking at on the screen here is about 10 minutes work and about $2 worth of materials. That's an idea for a tech system, a, a piece of software. Now, during the course of a day, you generate hundreds of these ideas and it costs you all of $200 in materials and you throw out most of them. But you throw out most of them in an environment where A, it's okay to throw them out, B, it's okay to generate them, and a handful get sort of picked up and moved on to a, another phase. We end up with concepts and ideas that we sort of bring to life in a, in a more vivid form. Um, we put some effort into those half dozen um, that we've only spent you know, a couple of minutes on to that point and you give them all a day. And for five or six ideas, you give each of them a day of your team's time and you develop them into a more fully fledged idea. And this could be anything. We're, we're, um, we're developing something like this at the moment um, in the very early stages of trying to understand the way prisoners get moved around our criminal justice system. There's a lot of waste. Most people who go into jail on that first night shouldn't be there. People who are arrested, most of them will go into jail. Most of those shouldn't be there. And they get moved all around the state because they get pushed out into remand centres and, and then they appear in court where they're subsequently released on bail. Most of them are, over 55% of people who show up in the courtroom for a bail hearing get released. And you would probably have been able to ascertain that in the first 30 seconds, which is exactly how long the, the average length of most people's first court appearance is, by the way. It's about 30 seconds, including plus six or seven hours travel time to move from the remand centre to the court so that the judge can go, yep, you're released on bail, you can go now. That kind of waste in the system is something that we're trying to tackle. You can illustrate that kind of thing quite readily with this. You can make it real and it becomes something that people can look at and point to and say, why the hell are we doing that? And when you articulate it in that kind of way and you ask that kind of question, and asking that kind of question is something designers are particularly well trained for, at least I seem to have a knack for it, what the hell are you doing? Becomes a really powerful question. Why, why would you do that? Why would you put someone on a bus for six hours for a 30 second hearing that you knew in advance the outcome? Why would you do that? Why would you set the system up that way? And why would you not change it if you could? This is something that we, we're trying to address at the moment. When you make things tangible, it gets it out of your head. It puts it in front of other people. You can do it in a form that is both easy, cheap and playful at times. Um, the use of Lego amongst designers has become, become quite popular. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether that's a similar sort of fetish to the post-it note thing or whether it's actually that it's a, a good tool. We're going to go with the latter because otherwise we've got some explaining to do. But um, Lego acts as a good way to illustrate what you mean by a system that actually moves um, and, a, and a system in which people move around and have various sorts of interactions, government services, public services, commercial services, all sort of uh, can be illustrated well in this kind of way. And you can put it in front of other people and say, 
kind of works like this. Now, what you're looking at here is one of the um, is the outputs of one of the sort of global service design jams. You're talking about sort of 20 minutes of activity to put these things together. Cheap. It's not a lot of effort. It's not a big investment in time. And if you're talking about a system that's ultimately going to cost, oh, I don't know, to pick a number, $37 billion, um, you might spend a little time prototyping what the service environment might actually look like before you do it. These sorts of big infrastructure projects and these big commercial systems can actually be unlocked and, and some really good input put into them in the early stages in very cheap ways. We then highly recommend you actually build a prototype. This is the National Australia Bank's new branch. This is the prototype that they built. They built it in a warehouse. They brought people in, say, we'd like you to go through and act like customers, do the sorts of things that you would normally do. If you go down to, I think they're all in Melbourne, but the National Australia Bank has subsequently rolled out five of these. Um, we did a, a, a project, uh, again, around superannuation, the end result of which well, the problem that we had was that people don't consolidate their superannuation. They tend to leave them, you know, you sort of move from job to job and you leave a trail of superannuation accounts behind you. Um, people end up with sort of 5, 10, 15, I've spoken to someone with 22, um, different superannuation accounts, you pay fees on all of them, and it really does hurt the amount of money that you have at retirement, and over time in quite substantial ways. So we spoke to, and we worked with a, a, a company to try and crack that problem. And we made a whole bunch of very, very small changes, none of which you would say, that's, that's the key insight that changed this. And yet we doubled the rate at which people were able to consolidate their super. Twice as many people were able to like, make it through the process by just removing some small pain points. And I come right back to something I said at the beginning about 100,000 improvements. If you make a lot of small changes, you can also make a difference, but you need to make changes in ways that break you out of established patterns. And this is the sort of way you can go about doing it, and doing it in progressively more expensive ways, built on a foundation that has some confidence. As a country, we still have um, some challenges. We have some challenges around climate. Um, one of my sort of favourite and least favourite, I guess, is our water resourcing on the Murray-Darling River system. Um, one of my pet hates is that as, as a nation and as a colony, we identified the problems of irrigation farming in this country within two years of first starting it. We tried it, we looked at it, this doesn't seem to be working. We seem to have all sorts of problems with soil erosion and salinity. And within two years of the first irrigation farms opening in this country, we're still doing it. We're still doing it in massive ways. We are stuck in a rut and we will not challenge those assumptions. We firmly believe that there is a way of farming in this country and we're not moving out of it. This sort of process, that ability to just suspend things for a moment and let me ask you a question that is along the lines of, what if there was no more irrigation farming in Australia? That's the sort of question that we need to think about when we're thinking about designing a society that's going to live for a thousand years. Because our decisions, they're going to have to live with for an awfully long time. And currently we're making them for ourselves and not for them. And one of the real challenges around innovation, one of the real challenges about this type of work is understanding who you're really designing for. And a lot of the time what we're doing is we're not really designing for the person in front of us. We're designing for their kids or their children's children or the person that they care for or the person that they're locking up or the person that they're trying to get out um, or get better. Or Our view of our customer and our view of our, our design target needs to shift accordingly as well. This sort of process, this sort of work where you get out of your office, where you get out in front of people, where you see the world around us and really look at it and observe it and try and tease it apart, this is a good way to sort of unlock different ways of thinking. We've had success with it um, and the work that's going on in various places shows that there is success to be had. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much for sitting and listening to me. Thank you.